The Diary of a Nobody by George and Weedon Grossmith, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter Three. A conversation with Mr. Merton on society. Mr. and Mrs. James of Sutton come up. A miserable evening at the Tank Theatre. Experiments with enamel paint. I make another good joke, but Gowing and Cummings are unnecessarily offended. I paint the bath red with unexpected result. April the 19th. Cummings called, bringing with him his friend Merton, who is in the wine trade. Gowing also called. Mr. Merton made himself at home at once, and Carrie and I were both struck with him immediately, and thoroughly approved of his sentiments. He leaned back in his chair and said, You must take me as I am. And I replied, Yes, and you must take us as we are. We're homely people. We're not swells. He answered, No, I can see that, and Gowing roared with laughter. But Merton, in a most gentlemanly manner, said to Gowing, I don't think you quite understand me. I intended to convey that our charming host and hostess were superior to the follies of fashion, and preferred leading a simple and wholesome life to gadding about to tuppenny halfpenny tea-drinking afternoons and living above their incomes. I was immensely pleased with these sensible remarks of Merton's, and concluded that subject by saying, No, candidly, Mr. Merton, we don't go into society, because we do not care for it. And what with the expense of cabs here and cabs there, and white gloves and white ties, etc., it doesn't seem worth the money. Merton said, in reference to friends, My motto is, few and true. And, by the way, I also apply that to wine, little and good. Gowing said, Yes, and sometimes cheap and tasty, eh, old man? Merton, still continuing, said he should treat me as a friend, and put me down for a dozen of his Lockenbar whisky, and as I was an old friend of Gowing, I should have it for thirty-six shillings, which was considerably under what he paid for it. He booked his own order, and further said that at any time I wanted any passes for the theatre, I was to let him know, as his name stood good for any theatre in London. April the 20th. Carrie reminded me that as her old school friend Annie Fuller's, now Mrs. James, and her husband had come up from Sutton for a few days, it would look kind to take them to the theatre, and would I drop a line to Mr. Merton asking him for passes for four, either for the Italian Opera, Haymarket, Savoy, or Lyceum. I wrote Merton to that effect. April the 21st got a reply from Merton saying he was very busy and just at present couldn't manage passes for the Italian Opera, Haymarket, Savoy, or Lyceum, but the best thing going on in London was the Brown Bushes at the Tank Theatre Islington, and enclosed seats for four, also bill for whisky. April the 23rd, Mr. and Mrs. James, Miss Fuller's that was, came to meet tea, and we left directly after for the Tank Theatre. We got a bus that took us to King's Cross, and then changed into one that took us to the Angel. Mr. James each time insisted on paying for all, saying that I had paid for the tickets, and that was quite enough. We arrived at theatre, where, curiously enough, all our busload except an old woman with a basket seemed to be going in. I walked ahead and presented the tickets. The man looked at them and called out, Mr. Willoughby? Do you know anything about these? Holding up my tickets. The gentleman called to, came up and examined my tickets, and said, Who gave you these? I said rather indignantly, Mr. Merton, of course. He said, Merton, who's he? I answered rather sharply, You ought to know, his name's good at any theatre in London. He replied, Oh, is it? Well, it ain't no good here. These tickets, which are not dated, were issued under Mr. Swinstead's management, which has since changed hands. While I was having some very unpleasant words with the man, James, who had gone upstairs with the ladies, called out, Come on! I went up after him, and a very civil attendant said, This way, please, box H. I said to James, Why, how on earth did you manage it? And to my horror he replied, Why, paid for it, of course. This was humiliating enough, and I could scarcely follow the play, but I was doomed to still further humiliation. 
I was leaning out of the box when my tie, a little black bow which fastened onto the stud by means of a new patent, fell into the pit below. A clumsy man, not noticing it, had his foot on it for ever so long before he discovered it. He then picked it up and eventually flung it under the next seat in disgust. What with the box incident and the tie, I felt quite miserable. Mr. James of Sutton was very good. He said, Don't worry, no one will notice it with your beard. That is the only advantage of growing one that I can see. There was no occasion for that remark, for Carrie is very proud of my beard. To hide the absence of the tie, I had to keep my chin down the rest of the evening, which caused a pain at the back of my neck. April the 24th could scarcely sleep a wink through thinking of having brought up Mr. and Mrs. James from the country to go to the theatre last night, and his having paid for a private box because our order was not honoured. And such a poor play, too. I wrote a very satirical letter to Merton, the wine merchant who gave us the pass, and said, considering we had to pay for our seats, we did our best to appreciate the performance. I thought this line rather cutting and I asked Carrie how many peas there were in Appreciate, and she said one. After I sent off the letter, I looked at the dictionary and found there were two, awfully vexed at this. Decided not to worry myself any more about the Jameses, for, as Carrie wisely said, we'll make it all right with them by asking them up from Sutton one evening next week to play at Bézique. April the 25th in consequence of Brickwell telling me his wife was working wonders with the new pink-folds enamel paint, I determined to try it. I bought two tins of red on my way home. I hastened through tea, went into the garden, and painted some flower-pots. I called out to Carrie, who said, You've always got some new-fangled craze, but she was obliged to admit that the flower-pots looked remarkably well went upstairs into the servant's bedroom and painted her washstand, towel-horse and chest of drawers. To my mind it was an extraordinary improvement, but as an example of the ignorance of the lower classes in the matter of taste, our servant Sarah, on seeing them, evinced no sign of pleasure, but merely said she thought they looked very well as they was before. April the 26th got some more red enamel paint, red to my mind being the best colour, and painted the coal-scuttle and the backs of our Shakespeare, the binding of which had almost worn out. April 27th painted the bath red, and was delighted with the result. Sorry to say Carrie was not, in fact we had a few words about it. She said I ought to have consulted her, and she had never heard of such a thing as a bath being painted red. I replied, it's merely a matter of taste. Fortunately, further argument on the subject was stopped by a voice saying, May I come in? It was only Cummings who said, Your maid opened the door and asked me to excuse her showing me in as she was wringing out some socks. I was delighted to see him and suggested we should have a game of whist with a dummy, and by way of merriment said, You can be the dummy. Cummings, I thought rather ill-naturedly, replied, Funny as usual. He said he couldn't stop, he only called to leave me the bicycle news, as he had done with it. Another ring at the bell. It was Gowing, who said he must apologise for coming so often, and that one of these days we must come round to see him. I said, a very extraordinary thing has struck me. Something funny, as usual, said Cummings. Yes, I replied. I think even you will say so this time. It's concerning you both. For well, doesn't it seem odd that Gowing's always coming, and Cummings always going? Carrie, who had evidently quite forgotten about the bath, went into fits of laughter, and as for myself I fairly doubled up in my chair till it cracked beneath me. I think this was one of the best jokes I have ever made. Then imagine my astonishment on perceiving both Cummings and Gowing perfectly silent, and without a smile on their faces. After rather an unpleasant pause, Cummings, who had opened a cigar-case, closed it up again and said, Yes, I think after that I shall be going, and I'm sorry I failed to see the fun of your jokes. Gowing said he didn't mind a joke when it wasn't rude, but a pun on a name to his thinking was certainly a little wanting in good taste. Cummings followed it up by saying, if it had been said by anyone else but myself, 
he shouldn't have entered the house again. This rather unpleasantly terminated what might have been a cheerful evening. However, it was as well they went, for the charwoman had finished up the remains of the cold pork. April the 28th. At the office the new and very young clerk, Pitt, who was very impudent to me a week or so ago, was late again. I told him it would be my duty to inform Mr. Perkup, the principal. To my surprise, Pitt apologised most humbly and in a most gentlemanly fashion. I was unfeignedly pleased to notice this improvement in his manner towards me, and told him I would look over his unpunctuality. Passing down the room an hour later, I received a smart smack in the face from a rolled-up ball of hard foolscap. I turned round sharply, but all the clerks were apparently riveted to their work. I am not a rich man, but I would have given half a sovereign to know whether that was thrown by accident or design. Went home early, and bought some more enamel paint, black this time, and spent the evening touching up the fender, picture frames, and an old pair of boots, making them look as good as new. Also painted Gowing's walking stick, which he left behind, and made it look like ebony. April the 29th, Sunday. Woke up with a fearful headache and strong symptoms of a cold. Carrie, with a perversity which is just like her, said it was painter's colic, and was the result of my having spent the last few days with my nose over a paint-pot. I told her firmly that I knew a great deal better what was the matter with me than she did. I had got a chill, and decided to have a bath as hot as I could bear it. Bath ready, could scarcely bear it so hot. I persevered and got in. Very hot, but very acceptable. I lay still for some time. On moving my hand above the surface of the water, I experienced the greatest fright I ever received in the whole course of my life. For imagine my horror on discovering my hand, as I had thought, full of blood. My first thought was that I had ruptured an artery, and was bleeding to death, and should be discovered later on, looking like a second Marat, as I remembered seeing him in Madame Tussaud's. My second thought was to ring the bell, but remembered there was no bell to ring. My third was that there was nothing but the enamel paint which had dissolved with boiling water. I stepped out of the bath, perfectly red all over, resembling the red Indians I have seen depicted at an East End theatre. I determined not to say a word to Carrie, but to tell Farmerson to come on Monday and paint the bath white. End of chapter